Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. James this morning. Beautiful summer morning. Hopefully we can stay cool throughout the day. Um, there aren't many announcements. I think Joan put most of them in the email that she sent, which I didn't print off, so I apologize for that. Um, I think we do need to thank Wilma once again for the lovely luncheon that she had in her backyard. I'm sorry I missed it, but I hear it was lovely, and um, I'm sure we'll do it again sometime. Um, there is coffee and refreshments downstairs after the, uh, after the service in the Morris Hall. We light the Christ candle this morning um, to remind ourselves and be thankful for the um, majesty of the universe and that we have the opportunity to be with God um, to celebrate that. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. The Lord is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? The Lord is our stronghold. Of whom shall we be afraid? As we wait on the Lord, let us be strong and of good courage. God has called us together and we have come. Let us thank God forever because of what God has done. Good morning, everyone. It's a delight to see everybody out this morning. It's another, hasn't it been a great week, weather-wise? Oh, my goodness. I said to Scott this morning, I think this is the best place in the world to live. We get a mixture of weather coming at us from all directions, but this year we've had no extremes, and even the humidity seems to be very modest, and in Europe they are suffering in such a difficult way uh, throughout Europe. It's been very, very difficult. So it is good to gather together to worship together this morning, uh, and we do so in, in wonderful weather. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 585, Christ You Call Us All to Serve.
Thank you. Please be seated. Let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Ever-present God, we seek and you offer. We ask and you give. We knock and you open the door. Ever-gracious God, you hear the requests of your people and in your goodness you answer. In Christ you offer the gifts of new life and hope to all who seek your blessing. Through your spirit, you pray within us, even when we cannot find words ourselves. Receive our praise and our prayers this day, O God, and draw us into your holy presence so that your love will transform us to serve you in the world you love. Ever faithful God, we quickly forget the gifts we have received from your grace. Instead of giving thanks, we ask for more. We complain about what we lack and fail to trust in your generosity. We refuse others the forgiveness we seek for ourselves. Forgive us, O God. Transform our hearts and reshape our desires to reflect your goodness in the way we live. Amen. God calls us to love one another deeply from the heart and to turn away from anything that separates us from God and from each other. We have been born anew through the living and enduring word of God. Know in your heart of hearts that we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. <laughs> so um, the theme for today is prayer. And I wanted to share with you something that has brought many people to a place of awe and mystery and wow, a place of humility and a sense that of course there's a God, because who else could create a universe of such great beauty? And of course, I'm talking about those very first pictures from the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, the headline in the Toronto Star was, out of this world, images from the powerful James Webb Telescope offer a beautiful bridge between science and art. Now, the best way to view these pictures, you can put that first slide up. Thank you, Merlin. Um, the best way to view these pictures is to go home and look on your own computer, Google James Webb pictures, and there they are. But I wanted to show them here. The definition, of course, is a little less, uh, but nevertheless, I wanted just to refresh your memory on to what these pictures are. This is one amazing space telescope, and it succeeds the Hubble, although the Hubble telescope is still up there and still um, orbiting Earth and uh, still taking uh, great, great photos. James Webb, which was la launched last Christmas Day, um, orbits the sun not Earth. And as you see there in that picture, the yellow part is, are the tiles, the yellow tiles that receive the light from distant, distant stars and distant galaxies. And the platform on which it seems to be resting is uh, a five-layer uh, construction that is used to keep the heat of the sun away from the tiles, because the tiles, the telescope itself, has to be kept at colder than minus 250 degrees Celsius. So its back, so to speak, is always to the sun, so that the sun never shines, uh, even though that it's millions of miles from, from the sun. Uh, nevertheless, it still impacts on those tiles. Sunlight has power. So. Um, if you could move to the next slide, please, Merlin. This is called a deep field, and the acronym there is just the number that the, uh, the astronomers have given it. But what this picture takes is a picture of stars and galaxies that are far, far, far away. And in that one picture, there are thousands of galaxies, um, and they go back in time. Light. We, when I turn on a flashlight, it looks instantaneous, doesn't it? I click the button and the light goes on. Light takes time to travel through space. If we could turn off our sun 
just go click and the sun was off, it would take eight minutes before we realized that the sun was off because the light is still traveling toward Earth. In the case of these galaxies and these stars, they go back 13.1 billion years. That's a long time, and we're closing in on the Big Bang, right, which is about 13.8. So we are getting closer and closer. Those, those lights, those galaxies, may not exist today. They certainly wouldn't look like they do when we take a picture of them. Because, but their light is still traveling toward us. So that's old light that we are seeing. And therefore, scientists can study old light. And that will lead them into a better understanding of the physics and the chemistry and the quantum mechanics and the gravitational forces that resulted right after the Big Bang. And so that's an amazing photo. And there are deep field pictures from the Hubble but that one is truly spectacular. The James Webb Telescope collects six times the amount of light that Hubble does. A uh, next picture, please, Merlin. Carina Nebula. Uh, is that not magnificent? That's a picture. That's a picture. It's not a painting. It's not artistic. That is a picture. Uh, it is 7,600 light years from Earth. Um, and so in this, this is a picture of uh, a star nursery resulting from stars that have already died. And just like everything in the universe is born, lives, and dies, including galaxies, including individual stars. And But out of dying stars come new stars. And here we have what looks like mountains, but is a star nursery. So there are very young stars that have been born and are in that. Um, and in, it doesn't, it's hard to see, but it, in the red images there, you can see growing infant stars, as they're titled. Next picture. Stevens Quintet. There are millions of amazing photographs of galaxies and galaxies that are interact with each other. You know, gravity, gravity keeps Earth going around the sun. Well, the sun is part of a galaxy that we call the Milky Way, right? So these are other galaxies that are out in space. In fact, the one on the very left is much closer to us than the one than the, the others on the and there are in fact four there. The middle one is two galaxies that are rotating around each other very tightly. So the four on the right are all connected and, and connected by gra gravity, so they influence each other. The one on the right is much closer, so it's a, like an optical illusion. It looks like it's part of the group, but it's not. 40 million light years from Earth is Stevens Quintet. Next picture, please. Uh, this is called the Southern Ring Nebula. Uh, and in, a, in it, um, it's a dying star, and in fact, there are two such stars. And if you squint a little bit, maybe, you can see that that bright dot in the middle is, are two dots. There are two stars there. Um, a pair of elderly stars orbiting each other, and they are approximately 2,500 light years from Earth. So they, as they die, they are giving off layers, they're outer layers of the, of the star. So they give off gas and dust, such as the dust we saw in the previous picture, uh, and that's what is surrounding them. It reminded me um, of uh, almost like an amoeba-like creature, or perhaps uh, when you cut uh, a quartz, piece of quartz open, and it's hollow inside, um, something like that. But that is millions and millions and millions of kilometers wide and long and deep. So stars, that, th those stars, those two stars are shedding their matter as they die. Uh, next and last picture. This is a graph. Astronomy is filled with numbers and graphs. But what they are detecting here, and you can see that they are detecting something, um, one of the purposes of James Webb is to search for exoplanets. Exoplanets are planets that orbit around other stars. And so they can, not only can they detect the, the, the planets that are orbiting around other stars now, 
um, but they can detect what lies in their atmosphere. And at the peak, you can't read it, but those where the words are written, that's water. That's water. There is water in the atmospheres of an exoplanet bajillions of miles away from us. And so scientists are getting closer and closer. We, when we look for, you know, people say, is there life elsewhere in the universe? We mean, we mean life like ours, some kind of living creature. Um, and, and so we think that water being essential, we are 70% of our bodies is made of water. We think that water is important. So we're looking for atmospheres that are similar to ours that might host other life forms of one sort or another. And they are able to detect that with, with the James Webb Telescope. So that, that's uh, it for the pictures, but it just reminds me, when I see those photos, it's jaw-dropping to realize, to put ourselves in context. Um, and, and there's a sense of awe and mystery and wow. Oh, there's a wow factor that you can't get anywhere else with that. And so we pray to God, uh, and, and we, you know, we talk about God's creation, and we tend to think of planet Earth, atmosphere, plants and animals, humans, water, oceans, rivers, lakes, etc., etc. But God is the Lord of the whole universe, and it is beautiful, and it is amazing. And we have been gifted. We're just starting to increase our understanding so that we can start exploring it by, by sight right now. And, uh, and so we give thanks to God for that. So let's, let's pray. Gracious God, how we praise your name and we are in awe of your creative imagination and the, the magnificence of the universe that we are allowed to peek into through uh, our development of technology. Loving God, we say thank you. Help us to remember that we are part of your creation and that we are so grateful to have lung, air in our lungs and to be alive and to be able to explore and to appreciate the beauty of the creation around us. We pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen. God of wisdom, by the leading of your spirit, open our minds to receive new insight from familiar stories. Open our hearts to grasp deeper truths revealed in the scriptures and through Jesus Christ, your living word. Amen. My grandson, Aidan, is now three years old, and for three years he has come to Scott's and my house one or two nights a week to facilitate my daughter and her son-in-law having a little time to themselves for both work purposes and downtime. So Aidan is well settled in with Nana and Papa, and we have our own routines. I am now trying to gently introduce something of faith in God to Aiden and praying to God and reading some of the stories in God's book, the Bible. His favorite story is that of David and Goliath because a little boy defeats a tall man who is being a bully. Goliath doesn't actually die in the children's Bible that I bought him. I also sing to him at bedtime, and not being very conversant in modern music, I sing what I know, children's hymns and lullabies. I sing, and he lesson, listens, and hopefully falls asleep within a few minutes. And sometimes, to be honest, it's a race to see which of us falls asleep first on a Sunday evening. Me and my rocker, and him in his bed. One day at his home, Aiden was preoccupied playing with some of his toys, and as he played, my daughter noticed that he was quietly singing, Jesus Loves Me, to himself. She was listening, and she recorded it on her cell phone. He knew all the words. I had never tried singing it with him, only to him at bedtime. But that sponge-like little brain absorbed all the words. And it was a lesson to me that there is no filter on that sponge. And so let's make sure it is good language and appropriate songs that he learns. Aiden and I also try praying together. And I say try 
because it is a work in progress. We ask God to bless all the people and his family, and his job is to say, God bless Daddy and God bless Mama, and God bless his other grandparents and his aunts and his uncles and his cousins, and sometimes other kids from the daycare, and sometimes characters in one of his books or on television. We pray for God's blessing for anyone he wants. He hasn't yet started asking those harder questions of, who is God and why can't I see God? No doubt they will come in time. I can still remember the prayer that I prayed each night when I was a little girl and my mother listened. And you, are, you may be familiar with it. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. God bless Daddy, God bless Mommy, and please God help Joan and Dale to be better girls tomorrow. Amen. <laughs> every night. I've never forgotten it. There is so much wrong with that prayer. It's horrifying to me today, but at the time of growing up, it never bothered me. I think I just said it from rote memory. That's what I was taught. That's what I said. But I will never teach it to Aiden. So from whom did you learn to pray? Did you learn as a child or as an adult, perhaps? Do you remember your early prayers? I heard, saw Doris mouthing the words as I said my prayer. Do you pray in some fashion today? What is prayer? Wikipedia has a great definition. Wikipedia says that prayer is an invocation or act that seeks to activate a rapport with an object of worship through deliberate communication. Right, sure. Billy Graham said, prayer was a two-way conversation between you and God. Someone else said, praying is talking to God and meditation is listening to God. I kind of like that last one. I also had to memorize something else when I was a child and maybe you did so as well. The Westminster Shorter Catechism that was written in 1646. Do you remember, not 1646, but do you remember the catechism? It was a long series of questions and answers that Sunday school kids were required to learn by heart. Do you remember the first question? Does anybody remember? Close. What is, man, what is the chief end of man? What is the chief end of man? What is the answer? To glorify God and enjoy him forever to glorify and enjoy. In 2004, a step away from 1646, the Presbyterian Church in Canada finally adopted an updated version of the Catechism, and question one now reads, what is God's purpose for our lives? That's a better question to ask. And the answer provided is, we have been made for joy. Joy in knowing, loving, and serving God, joy in loving, knowing, and serving one another, and joy in the wonder of all God's works, such as the space pictures we saw. Our Old Testament text is a psalm of thanksgiving and praise. It is spoken by one person to God in prayer and expresses gratitude and joy. Thank you to Lorraine Smart for reading the prayer of Psalm 138, verses 1 through 8. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing the ways of the Lord, for, the, for great is the glory of the Lord. For, the, for though the Lord 
is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his promise for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. Prayer in general is an act of surrender and supplication. When we are intentional about praying to God, we do so knowing that we don't have to pretend anything because God sees and knows everything about us. We cannot hide anything from God. So when we do reach out in prayer, we do so with deep humility and honesty. Any other approach is wasted time. Mahatma Gandhi said, prayer is not asking. It is a longing of the soul. It is daily admission of one's weakness. It is better in prayer to have a heart without words than words without a heart. When we're afraid, we don't have to put on a false front of bravery. God knows we are afraid. When we're angry, there's no point in trying to hide it because we can't. And so that sense of humility is very real. God sees the true us. Prayer is the turning away from ourselves to God in the confidence that God will provide whatever help we need. Being Presbyterian, the format of our weekly service uh, follows a specific order, and you are very familiar with it. And prayers form a significant portion of the service. Our first prayer is always one of adoration. Adoration is praise for God and nothing else. Simply praise for who God is and all that God has done and continues doing. Praise and gratitude go together. We are grateful that God is who God is. Praise at the beginning of the worship service raises our own spirits. It is hard to feel down when your prayers, when your praise and your gratitude are genuine. And if we're feeling afraid or angry, those emotions are, at least momentarily, washed away or diminished as we acknowledge the greatness and the goodness of God. Psalm 138, obviously, is a poem, a song of praise and gratitude for God. It is a hymn of thanksgiving. When we recite this psalm, we're praising God for God's steadfast love and faithfulness in all things. Spending time with God in prayer results in our strength of soul being increased. Prayer, as well as confession, is very good for the soul. And yet prayer is not disconnected from the realities of our lives. Verse 3 says, On the day I called, you answered me. In other words, some days are really tough. And one of the things that we're grateful for is that God is with us, even on those tough days. And when we're struggling with whatever, we can share that struggle with God in prayer and know that we are not alone. God cares for the lowly and is very much aware when the haughty, those who ignore the problems being faced by those around them, distance themselves. And the reality of life is that sometimes we're the lowly and sometimes we're the haughty. Taking everything to God in prayer helps us live in a more perceptive and balanced way. The final verse is, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. So question, do you believe that God has a purpose or purposes for you, purposes in your life? It puts a different slant on things when we're making decisions about our lives. Which decisions might fit better with God's purpose for me? And then there is very much that human cry of fear and trembling at the end. Do not forsake the work of your hands. 
Please don't forget me, God. God, I need you. I am only as strong as my faith in you. Please keep me strong so I can see and follow your purpose for me. Our praise and our thanksgiving are very real, even while we acknowledge our own fears and weaknesses and doubts. But it helps to be reminded that prayer is the lifeline we need to carry us through both the good times and the challenges. I think each of us develops our own prayer habits. Some of us rarely pray, and, by, and I mean by that intentionally, take a time and pray. Sometimes there's that constant conversation in your head, and you say, oh God, help me out of this mess. But when we take time to intentionally sit down, be quiet in the silence and pray. So some of us don't do that very often, while others are prayer warriors. They've lived a life of prayer, and prayer is so natural to who they are. The practice of prayer over the past two millennia has been recorded in the written works of many faithful men and women who loved God and communed with God all of their lives. There are many different ways to pray, and I think what is fun about exploring different practices of prayer is that you can discover what works best for you. If you are interested in exploring various kinds of prayer, let me know and we can figure out a plan. Uh, maybe for several of us uh, as a short-term study, and we just talk about prayer and we, we practice different kinds of prayer. In my last year at Knox College, I only had a few courses to fill up, so my timetable was not full. So I took two extra courses, and one of them was a whole course on prayer, and it was all practical. It was all practice, and I loved it. It was very, um, um, it was a spiritual experience to go through different ways of sharing what's inside with the Lord of the universe. So maybe we could do that here at St. James. Jesus' own disciples, seeing how much time he devoted to prayer, asked him to teach them how to pray. And John the Baptist also had a reputation for having taught his disciples how to pray as well. Our gospel text is from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. Perseverance in prayer. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as ta John taught his disciples. So he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers with, from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot give up, get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he did not get up, give up and give him anything out of friendship, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks the door, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, would give us a snake instead of a fish? Or if a child asks for an egg, would give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more would the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord. Amen. There are two versions of the Lord's Prayer in the New Testament. 
We just read the short version. The longer version is in Matthew. Luke's version does not contain references to a prayer that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it does not plea for God to rescue us from the evil one. As Protestants, we tack a doxology, words of praise about God, onto the end. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. A phrase that is not recorded in either Luke or Matthew. Jesus begins his prayer with praise for God and wishes that the world as God might envision it will continue to unfold. Jesus prays for sufficiency, for enough for well-being, and with humility. He prays for forgiveness from God, just as we, the prayers, forgive those who wrong us. And Jesus' prayer asks for grace, that we not be led down paths of temptation. Jesus doesn't stop with explicit uh, wording, however. He goes on to use his favorite teaching tool, a parable, to illustrate his meaning. Jesus knows how hard prayer is, both the ongoing practice of prayer and specific requests as we beg God for whenever we're really stretched. God says, stick to it. Never give up praying. Persist until you feel your prayer has been answered one way or another. And note that the persistence is very specific. The persistence of the man banging on the door of his neighbor is grounded in the need to serve someone else, not himself. And the reason the neighbor eventually grants his wish and gets up out of bed and gives his neighbor whatever it is he needs is for just exactly that reason. His neighbor is in need, and so he complies. And why does Jesus insist that's the right approach to prayer with God. Is God deaf when we need to repeat our petitions many times in order for God to acknowledge us? Does God want us to beg for help? The point of prayer is not to change God's mind, but to change us. An active prayer life changes us, how we live our lives, how we deal with devastating losses, how we interact with those around us. The point and the power of prayer is transformation. Does God hear our prayers? We must trust in the mystery of prayer, as did Jesus, and that's why we persevere. Jesus' approach to prayer suggests that the desires of our hearts ought to be shaped not by the values of our culture or our own personal interests, but by the principles of God's kingdom, compassion, peace, justice, freedom, and new life, new opportunities. Those are situations worth persevering for in prayer. Those are the characteristics of the kingdom, the kingdom that God yearns to bring about through us. Jesus himself perseveres in this teaching moment on prayer, by following up his parable with some very specific how-to statements. How do you persevere? Ask, and don't stop asking. Be proactive and search for your answers. They may come in understandings that surprise you. Take action. Knock on all those unopened doors that lay before you. Have the courage to move forward into unknown territory and don't quit. Never give up. God is there with every breath of your prayer. God, in God's wisdom, may choose to give us what we need rather than what we want. Will we be able to discern the difference? Perhaps we can consider prayer as being similar to buying one of those blank cards at the Hallmark store and then coming home and wondering, now what in the world am I going to say? Why didn't I just buy a card with flowers on the front and a generic poem inside? 
whatever it is that we sense a deep need for, Jesus promises that we will be gifted amply with the Holy Spirit and with a sense of God's presence in our lives and with God's good intentions for us. When we do buy that generic blank card, prayer card, when we recite the Lord's Prayer over and over again, week in and week out, blindly, by memory, perhaps that is when we are in most need for God's Holy Spirit, intervening into our thoughts, our words, and our lives. Prayer has a power unto itself, and we are blessed to be able to actively participate in it, to pursue a powerful prayer life, and to never abandon it in apathy or walk away because prayer seems unanswered. Let us pray that God will allow the Holy Spirit to wash over our indifference and ignite our passion for prayer in all of our circumstances. May the yearning in our souls be answered through prayer as we seek to find our heart's true home. Thanks be to God for the gift of prayer, alone in our own thoughts, collectively as we worship in a worship service, and whenever we find ourselves in awe of God's world. Amen. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, work in us. Open the eyes of our hearts to sense your presence and give us the wisdom so that we might live our lives guided by your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so our hymn is the Lord's Prayer. Please rise and sing it with me. Thank mm-hmm. you. hear the prayers of the people. Lord God, loving God, we come before you in prayer 
trusting that your power works in the world in ways we cannot imagine. We thank you for calling goodness forward, for supporting love and creating justice, even in situations which seem hopeless to us. Draw on our prayers this day as signs of your spirit at work in our lives. God of the world and all its peoples, we pray today for those who suffer in troubled nations. In Ukraine, Syria, Palestine, Ethiopia and Tigray, Myanmar and other places. Call the powerful to account, O God, and inspire leaders with the courage to listen to voices that cry out in pain and desperation. God of our everyday lives, we pray today for all those whose everyday lives have been disrupted by forces beyond their control, those struggling with the increasing effects of COVID-19 and other illnesses, those burdened by the rising costs of daily needs, those facing effects of climate change on their communities. Inspire governments to combine compassion and good planning to respond to those who face such upheaval. God of the courageous and compassionate, we pray for those who live out their commitment to the well-being of others day by day in healthcare, education, social work, public service, and environmental concern. Support them in times of stress and inspire them to speak out when they see needs being neglected. God of our homes and families, we pray for our friends and neighbors near and far, for all who travel and for those who find themselves strangers in new communities. Draw near to each one in deep need, especially those on our hearts today. Hear our personal prayers, God. Equip us, God, to support those lives that intertwine with ours, for we are your people, embraced by your love. To you be all praise and glory. Amen. The stories of Scripture remind us that there are many ways to give in gratitude for God's goodness to us. Whatever we have to give, let us give it joyfully and generously trusting God to do more than we can ask or imagine in the name of Christ, our living Lord.
Generous God, we offer you our gifts, thankful that your love is overflowing. Bless these gifts so that your love will flow through them to meet the needs of those who cry out to you and to us. For Christ's sake. Amen. Thank you. And our concluding hymn is number 410, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You. to never sell yourself short, grace to risk something big for something good, and grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. May the blessing of God most wonderful, whom the saints have trusted as creator, son, and spirit, be with you now and evermore. Go in peace to love and serve God. <laughs>